Willful Virgin by Marilyn Fry, Part 3, Making Worlds of Sense, Essay Number 14, White Woman Feminist, 1983-1992. to <clears throat> Introduction. This essay is the latest version of something I have been rewriting ever since my essay, On Being White, was published in The Politics of Reality. In a way, this is that first essay, emerging after several metamorphoses. On Being White grew out of experiences I had in my home lesbian community in which I was discovering some of what it meant for a woman, a feminist, to be white. These were very frustrating experiences. They played out and revealed the ways in which the fact that I am white gave unbidden and unwanted meanings to my thought and my actions and poisoned them with all my privilege. An intermediate version of this work, delivered at various colleges and universities around 1984 to 1986, began with the following account of my attempts to come to grips with the fact of being white in a white supremacist racist state and with some of the criticism my first effort had drawn. Quote, Many white feminists, myself included, have tried to identify and change the attitudes and behaviors which blocked our friendly and effective comradeship with women of color and limited our ability to act against institutional racism. I assumed, at first, that these revisions would begin with analysis and decision. I had to understand the problems and then do whatever would affect the changes dictated by the understanding. But as I entered this work, I almost immediately learned that my competence to do, to do it was questionable." End quote. The idea was put to me by several women of color and was stated in writings by women of color that a white woman is not in a good position to analyze institutional or personal racism and a white woman's decisions about what to do about racism cannot be authentic. About consciousness raising groups for white women, Sharon Keller said to me in a letter, quote, I think that there are things which white women working together can accomplish, but I do not think that white women are in the best positions usually to know what those things are or when it is the right time to do them. It would go a long way for white women to take seriously their relative helplessness in this matter, end quote. White women's analysis of their own racism has often been heard by women of color as quote unquote, mere psychologizing. To be rid of racism, a white woman may indeed have to do some introspecting, remembering and verbalizing of feelings, but the self-knowledge which she might achieve by this work would necessarily produce profound change and there are many reasons why white women may not want to change. White women's efforts to gain self-knowledge are easily undermined by the desire not to live out the consequences of getting it. Their slash our projects of consciousness raising and self-analysis are very susceptible to the slide from quote, working on yourself to quote unquote, playing with yourself. Apparently, the white woman herself is ill-situated, sorry, ill-suited for telling which is which. All of my ways of knowing seem to have paled me. My perception, my common sense, my goodwill, my anger, honor and affection, my intelligence and insight. Just as walking requires something fairly sturdy and firm underfoot, so being an actor in the world requires a foundation on or of ordinary moral and intellectual confidence. Without that, we don't know how to be or how to act. We become strangely stupid. The commitment against racism becomes itself immobilizing. Even obvious and easy acts either do not occur to us or threaten to be racist by presumptuous assumptions or misjudged timing, wording, or circumstances. Simple things like courtesy or giving money, attending a trial, working on a project initiated by a woman of color, or dissenting from racist views expressed on a white company become fraught with possibility of error and offense. If you want to be good, and you don't know good from bad, how can you move? Thus stranded, we also learned that it was exploitive and oppressive to ask for the help of women of color in extricating ourselves from the, this ignorance, confusion, incompetence, and moral failure. Our racism is our problem, not theirs. Some white women report that the great enemy of their efforts to combat their own racism is their feelings of guilt. This is not my own experience, or that is not my word for it. The great enemies in my heart have been the despair and resentment which come with being required 
by others and by my own integrity, to repair something apparently irreparable, required to take responsibility for something apparently beyond my powers to effect. Both confounded and angry, my own temptation is to collapse, to admit defeat and retire from the field. What counteracts that temptation for me seems to be little more than willfulness and lust. I will not be broken, and my appetite for women's touch is not, thank goodness, thoroughly civilized to establish categories. But if I cannot give up and I cannot act, what do will and lust recommend? The obvious way out of the relentless logic of my situation is to cease being white. The Contingency of Racedness I was brought up with a concept of race according to which you cannot stop being the race that you are. Your race is an irreversible physical, indeed ontological fact, about you. And when the criteria for membership in a race came up as an issue among white people I knew, considerations of skin color and biological lineage were not definitive or decisive, or rather, they were so precisely they were so precisely when white people decided they should be and were not but white people decided them not to be. As I argued in On Being White, white people actively legislate matters of race membership, and if asserting their right to do something requires race membership, sorry, and if asserting their right to do so requires making decisions that override physical criteria, they ignore physical criteria, without, of course, ever abandoning the ideological strategy of insisting the categories are given in nature. This sort of behavior clearly demonstrates that people construct race actively and that people who think they are unquestionably white generally think the criteria of what it is to be of this race or that of theirs are theirs to manipulate. Being white is not a biological condition. It is being a member of a certain social slash political category, a category that is persistently maintained by those people who are, in their own and each other's perceptions, the most unquestionably in it. It is like being a member of a political party, or a club, or a fraternity, or being a Methodist or a Mormon. If one is white, one is a member of a continuously and politically con constituted group which holds itself together by rituals of unity and exclusion, which develops in its members certain styles and attitudes towards the exploitation of others, which demands and rewards fraternal loyalty, which defines itself as the paradigm of humanity, and which rationalizes and naturalizes its existence and its practices of exclusion, colonization, slavery, and genocide, when it bothers to, in terms of methodology, sorry, in terms of mythology of blood and skin. If you are born to people who are members of that club, you are socialized, and inducted into that club. Your membership in it is in a way, or to a degree, compulsory. Nobody gave you a choice in the matter, but it is contingent and, in the Aristotelian sense, accidental. Well then, if you don't like being a member of that club, you might think of resigning your membership, or of figuring out how to get yourself kicked out of that club, how to get yourself excommunicated. But this strategy of quote-unquote separation is vulnerable to a variety of criticisms. A white woman cannot cease having the history that she has by some sort of divorce ritual. Furthermore, the renunciation of whiteness may be an act of self-loathing rather than an act of liberation. And dissociation from the race group one was born into might seem to be an option for white folks, but seems either not possible or not politically desirable to most members of other groups from which the whites set themselves off. This criticism suggests that my thinking of dissociating from membership in the white fraternity is just another exercise, hence another reinforcement, of that white privilege which I was so was finding so erroneous and attempting to escape. All these criticisms sound right, and I will circle back to them at the end of the essay. But there is something very wrong here. This closure has the distinctive finality of a trap. In academic circles, where I now circulate, it has become a commonplace that race is a quote-unquote social construction and not a naturally given and naturally maintained grouping of human individuals with naturally determined sets of traits. And the recognition of race as non-natural is presumed in those circles to be liberatory. 
pursuing the idea of dissociating from the race category in which I am placed and from the prerequisites attached to it is in a way pursuing the question of what freedom can be made of this and for whom. But it is seeming to me that race, together with racism and race privilege, is apparently constructed as something inescapable. And it makes sense that it would be, since such a construction would best serve those served by race and racism. Of course, race and racism are impossible to escape. Of course, a white person is always in a sticky web of privilege that permits only acts which reinforce, reinscribe racism. This just means that some exit must be forced. That will require conceptual creativity and perhaps conceptual violence. The quote-unquote being white that was that has presented itself to me as a burden and as an inseparable block to my own growth out of racism is not essentially about the color of my skin or any other inherited bodily trait, even though doctrines of color are bound up with this status in some ways. The problem, then, is to find a way to think clearly about some kind of whiteness that is not essentially tied to color and yet has some significant relation to color. The distinction feminists have made between maleness and masculinity provides a clue and an analogy. Maleness we have constructed as something a human animal can be born with. Masculinity we have constructed as something a human animal can be trained to. And it is an empirical fact that most male human animals are trained to it in one or another of its cultural varieties. Masculinity is not a blossoming consequence of genetic constitution as lush growths of facial hair seem to be in the males of many human groups. But the masculinity of an adult male is far from superficial or incidental, and we know it is not something an individual could shrug off like a coat or snap out of like an actor stepping out of his character. The masculinity of an adult male human is in particular, is in any particular culture, is also profoundly connected with the local perceptions and conceptions of maleness as quote-unquote biological, its causes and its consequences. So it may be with being white, but we need some version of our vocabulary to say it rightly. Oh, some revision of our vocabulary to say it rightly. We need a term in the realm of race and racism whose grammar is analogous to the grammar of the term masculinity. I am tempted to recommend the neologism, albosity, for this honor. But I'm afraid it is too strange to catch on. So I will introduce whitely and whiteliness in terms of whose grammar is analogous to that of masculine and masculinity. Being white-skinned, like being male, is a matter of physical traits presumed to be physically determined. Being whitely, like being masculine, I conceive of as a deeply ingrained way of being in the world. Following the analogy with masculinity, I assume that the connection between whiteliness and light colored skin is a, is a contingent connection. This character could be manifested by persons who are not quote unquote white. It could be absent in persons who are. In the next section, I will talk about whiteliness in a free and speculative way, exploring what it may be. This work is raw, preliminary sketching. It moves against no such background of research or attentive observation as there is to guide accounts of masculinity. There is, of course, a large literature on racism, but I think that what I am after here is not one the same thing as racism, either institutional or personal. Whiteliness is connected to institutional racism, as will emerge further on the discussion. But the fact that individuals with this sort of character are well suited to the social roles of agents of institutional racism, but it is a character of persons, not of institutions. 
whiteliness is also related to individual or personal racism. But I think it is not one and the same thing as racism, at least in the sense where racism means bigotry slash hate slash ignorance slash indifference. As I understand masculinity, it is not the same thing as misogyny. Similarly, whiteliness is not the same thing as race hatred. One can be whitely even if one's beliefs and feelings are relatively well-informed, humane, and good-willed. So I approach whiteliness freshly, as itself, as something which is both familiar and unknown. Whiteliness. To begin to get a picture of what whiteliness is, we need to invoke a certain candid and thoughtful reflection on that part of white people, who are, of course, in some ways, know themselves best. We also need to listen to what people of color perceive of white people, since in some ways they know white people best. For purposes of this brief and preliminary exploration, I will draw on material from three books for documentation of how white people are presented in the experience of people of color. The three are This Bridge Called My Back, which is a collection of writings from radical women of color, Feminist Theory from Margin to Center by Black theorist Bell Hooks, and Dry Longs Go, which is a collection of narratives of members of what its editor called, quote-unquote, the core Black community. For white voices, I draw on my own and those I have heard as participant slash observer of white culture and on Minnie Bruce Pratt. Minnie Bruce Pratt, a feminist and a white Southerner, has spelled out some of what I would call the whitely way of dealing with issues of morality and change. She said she had been taught to be a judge, a judge of responsibility, and of punishment according to an ethical system which countenanced no rival. She had been taught to be a preacher, to point out wrongs and tell others what to do. She had been taught to be a martyr, to take all responsibility and all glory. She had been taught to be a peacemaker, because she could see all sides and see how it ought to be. I was taught something like this, growing up in a small town south of the Mason-Dixon line, in a self-conscientiously Christian and white family. I learned that I, and quote-unquote we, knew right from wrong, and had the responsibility to see to it right was done. That there were others who did not know what it is right, sorry, what is right and wrong, and should be advised, instructed, helped, and directed by us. I was taught that because one knows what it is right, it is morally appropriate to have and exercise what I now would call race privilege and class privilege. Not quote-unquote might is right, but quote-unquote, right is might, as Carolyn Schaefer put the point. In any matter in which we did not know what is right, through youth or in inexpertise of some sort, we should await the judgment or instruction of another white person who does. A quote from Dry Long's Go. White people are bolder because they think they are supposed to know everything anyhow. White men look up to their leaders more than we do, and they are not much good without their leaders. White people don't really know how they feel about anything until they consult their leaders or a book or other things outside themselves. White people are not supposed to be stupid, so they tend to think they are intelligent, no matter how stupidly they behave. A quote from Feminist Theory from Margin to Center. The possibility they were not the best spokesperson for all women made them fear for their self-worth. <clears throat> Whitely people generally consider themselves to be benevolent and good-willed, fair, honest, and ethical. The judge, preacher, peacemaker, martyr, socialist, professional, moral majority, liberal, radical, conservative, working men and women. Nobody admits to being prejudiced, 
Everybody has earned every cent they have ever had, doesn't take sides, doesn't hate anybody, and always votes for the person they think best qualified for the job, regardless of the candidate's race, sex, religion, or national origin, maybe even regardless of their sexual preferences. The professional version of this person is always profoundly insulted by the suggestion that she slash he might have permitted some personal feeling about a client to affect the quality of services rendered. She slash he believes with perfect confidence that she slash he is not prejudiced, not a bigot, not spiteful, jealous, or rude, does not engage in favoritism or discrimination. When there is a series, serious and legitimate challenge, a negotiator has to find a resolution which enables the professional person to save face, to avoid simply agreeing that she slash he made an unfair or unjust judgment discriminated against someone or otherwise behaved badly. Whitely people have a staggering faith in their own rightness and goodness and that other people, sorry, and that of other whitely people. We are not crooks. Some quotes from um, Dry Longs Go. Every reasonable black person thinks that most white people do not mean him well. They figure if nobody blows the whistle, then nothing wrong has gone down. White people are very interested in seeming to be of service. White folks can't do right, even if there was one who wanted to. They are so damned greedy and cheap that it even hurts them to try to do right. A quote from this bridge called my back. A child is trick-or-treating with her friends. At one house, the woman, after realizing the child was Indian, quite crudely told me, so refusing to give me treats, that my friends had refu- had received. A quote from Dry Longs Go. I used to be a waitress, and I can still remember how white people would leave a tip, and then someone at the table, generally some white woman, would take some of the money. A few quotes from this bridge called my back. The lies, pretensions, and snobbery and cliquishness. We experience white feminists and their organizations as elitist, crudely insensitive and condescending. White people are so rarely loyal. White people do have a sense of right and wrong and are ethical. Their ethics is in a great part in ethics of forms, procedures, and due process. As many Bruce Pratt said, their morality is a matter of ought to's, not want to, or passionately desire to, and the oughts tend to factor out in propriety or good manners and abiding by the rules. Change cannot be initiated unless the moves are made in appropriate ways. The rules are often rehearsed, I have participated in whitely women's affirming to each other that some are uncomfortable disruptions caused by some someone objecting to some injustice or some offense could be avoided. Had she brought her problem forth in the correct way, it would have been correctly processed. We say, quote unquote, she should have brought it up in the business meeting, quote unquote. She should have taken the other woman aside and explained that the remark had offended her. Quote unquote, she should not have personally attacked me. She should have just told me that my behavior made her uncomfortable and I would have stopped doing it. Quote unquote, she should take this through the grievance procedure. By believing in rules, by being arbiter of rules, by understanding agency in terms of the application of principles to particular situations, whitely people think they preserve their detachment from prejudice, bias, meanness, and so on. Whitely people tend to believe that one preserves one goodness by being principled, by acting according to rules instead of according to feeling. A quote from Dry Longs Go. We think white people are the most unprincipled folks in the world. White people are some writing folks. They will write. They write everything. Now, they do that because they don't trust each other. Also, they are the kind of people who think that you can think about everything, about whether you are going... 
you're going to do before you do that thing. Now that's bad for them because you can't do that without wings. All you can do is what you know has got to be done as right as you know how to do that thing. White people don't seem to know that. He keeps changing the rules. Now Charlie will rule you to death. Authority seems to be central to whiteness, as you might expect from people who are raised to run things or to aspire to that. Belief in one's authority in matters practical, moral, and intellectual exists in tension with the insecurity and hypocrisy that are essentially connected with the pretense of infallibility. This pretentiousness makes the whitey whitely person simultaneously rude, condescending, overbearing, and patronizing on the one hand, and on the other, weak, helpless, insecure, and seeking validation of her or his goodness. Quotes from Dry Longsgo. White people have got to bluff it out as rulers are always unsure of themselves. No matter what Charlie do, he want his mama to pat him on the head and tell him how cute he is. In a very real sense, white men never grow up. Hard on the outside, soft on the inside. Quotes from a bridge, this bridge called my back. Socially, juvenile and tasteless. No responsibility to others. The dogmatic belief in whitely authority and rightness is also at odds with any commitment to truth. Quotes from Dry Longsgo. They won't tell each other the truth, and the lies they tell each other sound better to them than the truth from our mouths. As long as they can make someone say rough is smooth, they are happy. Like I told you, white folks don't care about what the truth is. It's like when you lie, but so much you don't know what the truth is. You simply cannot be honest with white people. A quote from this bridge called My Back. White feminists have a serious problem with truth and quote-unquote accountability. And finally, whitely people make it clear to people of other races that the last thing the latter are supposed to do is challenge whitely people's authority. A quote from this bridge called my back. We are expected by white women to move, charm, or entertain, but not to educate in ways that are threatening to our audience. A quote from feminist theory from margin to center. Though they expected us to provide first-hand accounts of black experience, they felt it was their role to decide if these experiences were authentic. Often in situations where white feminists aggressively attacked individual black women, they saw themselves as the ones who were under attack, who were the victims. A quote from Dry Longsco. Most white people, Anyways, all the white people I know are people you wouldn't want to explain anything to. No wonder whitely people have so much trouble learning so much trouble receiving, understanding, and acting on moral or political criticism and demands for change. How can you be a preacher who, do not, who does not know right from wrong, a judge who is an incompetent observer, a martyr who victimizes others, a peacemaker who is the problem, an authority without authority, a grown-up who is a child? How can someone who is supposed to be running the world acknowledge their relative powerlessness in some matters in any politically constructive way. Any serious moral or political challenge to a whitely person must be a direct threat to her or his very being. Whiteliness and class. What I have been exploring here and calling whiteliness may sound to some like it is a character of middle-class white people or perhaps of middle-class people, whatever their race. It may sound like a class phenomenon, not a race phenomenon. Before addressing this question more deeply, I should just register that it is my impression, just looking around the world, that white self-righteousness is not exclusive to the middle class. Many poor and working class white people are perfectly confident that they are more intelligent, know more, 
have better judgment and are more moral than black people or Chicanos or Puerto Ricans or Indians or anyone else they view as not white and believe that they would be perfectly competent to run the country and to rule others justly and righteously if given the opportunity. But this issue of their relation of whiteness, whiteliness to class deserves further attention. Though I think that what I am talking about is a phenomenon of race, I want to acknowledge a close interweaving and double de determination of manifestations and outcomes of race and of class, and to consider some of the things that give rise to the impression that what I'm calling whiteliness may just may really just be quote unquote middle classness. One thing that has happened here is that the individual who contributed to the observations assembled in the preceding section as a participant observer among white people, vis-a-vis -vis the author of this analysis, is herself a lifelong member of the middle class. The whiteliness in which she has participated and about which she can write most vividly and authentically is that of her own kin, associates, and larger social group. This might, to a certain extent, bias that section's descriptions of whiteliness toward a middle class version of it. Another reason that what I am calling whiteliness might appear to be a class character rather than a race one is that even if it is not a particular, sorry, a, not part peculiar to whites of the middle class, it is nonetheless peculiarity, sorry, peculiarly suited to them. It suits them to their jobs and social roles of managing, policing, training and disciplining, legislating and administering in a capitalist bureaucratic social order. Another interesting point in this connection is that the definition of a dominant race tends to fasten on the project of image of a dominant group within the race as paradigmatic of the race. The ways in which individual members of that elite group enact and manifest their racedness and dominance would constitute a sort of norm of enacting and manifesting this raceness, which non-elite members of the race would generally tend to assimilate themselves to. Those ways of enacting and manifesting racedness would also carry marks of the class po position of the paradigmatic elite within the race, and these marks too would appear in the enactments of race by the non-elite. In short, the ways members of the race generally enact and stylistically manifest membership in the race would tend to bear marks of the class status of the elite paradigmatic members of the race. I do not think whiteness is just middle classness misnamed. I think of whiteliness as a way of being which extends across ethnic, cultural, and class categories and occurs in ethnic, cultural, and class varieties. Varieties which may tend to blend toward a norm set by the elite groups within the race. Whatever class and ethnic variety there is among white people, though, such niceties seem often to have no particular salience in the experience people of other races have with white people. It is very significant that the people of color from whose writings and narratives I have quoted in the preceding section often characterize the white people they talk about in part by class status, but they do not make anything of it. They do not generally indicate that class differences among white people make much difference in how people of color experience them. Speaking of the oppression of women, Gail Rubin no noted its quote-unquote endless variety and mon monotonous similarity. There is great variety among the men of all the nationalities, races, religions, and positions in various economies and politics, and women do take into account the particulars of the men they must do deal with. But when our understanding of the world is conditioned by consciousness of sexism and misogyny, we see also very clearly the impressive and monotonous lack of variety among quote unquote masculinities. With my notion of whiteliness, I am reaching for the monotonous similarity, not the endless variety in white folks way of being in the world. For various reasons, that monotonous similarity may have a middle-class cast to it, or my own perception of it may give a middle-class cast. But I think that what I am calling quote-unquote whiteliness is a phenomenon of race. It is integral to what constructs and what is constructed by race and only more indirectly related to class.
Feminism and whiteliness. Being whitely, like being anything else in a sexist culture, is not the same thing in the lives of white women as it is in the lives of white men. The political significance of one's whiteliness interacts with the political significance of one's status as female or male in the male supremacist culture. For the white man, a whitely way of being in the world is very harmonious with masculinity and their social and political situation. For white women, it is, of course, all very much more complicated. Femininity in white women is praised and encouraged, but is nonetheless contemptible as weakness, dependence, feather-brainedness, vulnerability, and so on. But whiteliness in white women is unambivalently taken among white people as an appropriate enactment of positive status. Because of this, for white women, whiteliness works more consistently than femininity does to disguise and conceal their negative value and low status as women, and at the same time, to appear to compensate for it or to offset it. Those of us who are born female and white are born into the status created by white men's hatred and contempt for women. But white girls asp aspire to being an integrity like anyone else. Racism translates this into an aspiration to whiteliness. The white girl learns that whiteliness is dignity and respectability. She learns that whiteliness is her aptitude for partnership with white men. She learns that partnership with white man is her salvation from the original position of an individual character, seems to put it in the woman's own power to lever herself up out of a kind of non-being, the status of women in a male supremacist social order, over into a kind of being, the status of white in a white supremacist social order. But whiteliness does not save white women from the condition of woman. Quite the contrary. A white woman's whiteliness is deeply involved in her oppression as a woman and works against her liberation. White women are deceived, deceive ourselves, and will deceive others about ourselves if we believe that by being whitely, we can escape the fate of being the woman of the white man. The rational, righteous, and ruly, rule-abiding and rule-enforcing, do for some of us, sorry, do for some of us, some of the time, buy a ticket to a higher level of material well-being than we might otherwise be permitted, though it is not dependable. But the reason, right, and rules are not of our own making. The white man may welcome our whiteliness as endorsements of their own values and as an expression of our loyalty to them, that is, as proof of their power over us, and because it makes us good helpmates to them. But it is our whiteliness commands, sorry, but if our whiteliness commands any respect, it is only in the sense that a woman who is chaste and obedient is called, by classical patriarchal reversal, quote unquote, respectable. It is commonly claimed that the women's movement in the United States this past couple of decades is a white woman's movement. This claim is grossly disrespectful to the many feminists whom the label white does not fit. But it is indeed the case that millions of white women have been drawn to and engaged in feminist action and theorizing, and this creative engagement did not arise from those women's being respected for their nice, whitely ways by white men. This arose from rape, battery, powerlessness, poverty, or material dependence, spiritual depletion, degradation, harassment, servitude, insanity, drug addiction, botched abortion, and murder of those very women, those women who are white. As Doris Davenport put in her analysis of white feminist racism, quote, a few of us third world women see beyond the so-called privilege of being white and perceive white women as very oppressed and ironically invisible. It would seem that some white feminist could see this too. Instead, they cling to their myth of being privileged, powerful, and less oppressed than black women. Somewhere deep down, denied and almost killed, in the psyche of racist white feminists, there is some perception of their real position, powerless, spineless, and invisible. Rather than examine it, they run from it. Rather than seek solidarity with women of color, they pull rank within themselves, end quote. For many reasons, it is difficult for women of any intersection of demographic groups 
to grasp the enormity and the full depth and breadth of their oppression and of men's hatred and contempt for them. One reason is simply that the facts are so ugly and the image is of that oppressed, despised, and degraded woman so horrible that she recognizes sorry, that recognizing herself as oneself seems to be accepting utter defeat. Some woman at some time, I am sure, must deny to survive. But in the larger picture, denial, at least deep and sustained denial, of one's own oppression cuts one off from the appreciation of the oppression of others, which is necessary for the connections one needs. This is what I think Sherry Moraga is pointing out when she says, quote, Without an emotional, heartfelt grappling with the source of our own oppression, without naming the enemy within ourselves and outside of ourselves, no authentic, non-hierarchical connection among oppressed groups can take place, end quote. If white women are not able to ally with women of other races in the construction of another world, we will indeed remain defeated in this one. White women's whiteliness does not deliver the deliverance we are taught it would. Our whiteliness interferes with our own ability to form necessary connections, both by inhibiting and muddling our understanding of our own oppression as women, and by making us personally obnoxious and insufferable to many other women much of the time. It also is directly opposed to our liberation because it joins and binds us to our oppressors. By our whitely ways of being, we enact partnership and racial solidarity with men. We animate a social, if not also sexual, heterosexual union with men. We embody and express our possession by white men. A feminist that boldly names the oppression and, degrade, sorry, and degraded condition of white women and recognizes white men as its primary agents and primary beneficiaries. Such a feminism can make it obvious to white women that the various forms of mating and racial bonding with white men do not and will never save us from that condition. Such a feminist understanding might free us from the awful confusion of thinking our whiteliness is dignity and might make it possible for us to know that it is a dreadful mistake to think that our whiteliness earns us our personhood. Such knowledge can open up the possibility of practical understanding of whiteliness as a learned character, as we have already understood masculinity and femininity, a character by which we facilitate our own containment under the quote-unquote protection of white men, a character which interferes constantly and often conclusively with our ability to be friends with women of other races, a character by which we station ourselves as lieutenants and stenographers of white male power, a character which is not desirable in itself and neither manifests nor merits the full being to which we aspire. A character by which, in fact, we both participate in and cover up our own defeat. We might then include among our strategies for change a practice of unlearning whiteliness. And as we proceed in this, we can only become less and less well-assimilated members of that racial group called, quote-unquote, white. Open parentheses. I must state as clearly as possible that I do not claim that unbecoming white Lee is the only thing white women need to do to combat racism. I have said that whiteliness is not the same thing as racism. I have no thought what, whatever that I am offering a panacea for the eradication of racism. I do think that being whitely interferes enormously with white women's attempts in general to be anti-racist. Close parentheses. Disaffiliation, Deconstruction, Demolition To construct a concept is to analyze it in a way which reveals its construction, both in the temporal sense of its birth and development over time, and in a certain cultural and political matrix, and in the sense of its own present structure, its meaning, and its relation to other concepts. One of the most impressive aspects of such an analysis is the, relevation, the revelation of of the quote-unquote contingency of the concept, i.e. the fact that it is only the accidental collaboration of various historical events and circumstances that brought that concept into being, and the fact that there could be a world of sense without that concept in it. 
The other very impressive thing about such analyses is what they reveal of the complex and intense interplay of construction of concepts and construction of concrete realities. This interplay is what I take to be that phenomenon called the quote-unquote construction of reality. In combination, the revelation of the historical contingency of a concept and the revelation of the intricacy of interplay between concept and the concrete lived reality gives rise to a strong sense that quote-unquote deconstruction of a concept simultaneously dismantles the reality in which social construction, the evolution of the concept, is so closely involved. But things do not work that way. In the first place, analyzing a concept and circulating the analysis among a few interested colleagues does not make the concept go away, does not dislodge it from the matrix of, conce of concepts in the actively conceptual repertoire even of those few people, much less of people in general. In the second place, even if the deconstructive analysis so drains the concept of power from those few individuals that they can no longer use it, and perhaps their participation in the social construction of which that concept is a part becomes awkward and halting, like tying your shoelaces while thinking di directly about what you are doing, it still leaves those social constructions fully intact. Once constructed and assimilated, a social construct may be a pretty sturdy thing, not very vulnerable to erosion, decay, or demolition. It is one thing to quote-unquote deconstruct a concept, another to dismantle a well-established, well-entrenched social construct. For example, Foucault's revelations about the arbitrariness and coerciveness of classification of sexualities did not put an end to queer bashing or to the fears lesbians and gay men have of being victims of a witch hunt. I am interested, as I suggested earlier in this essay, in the matter of how to translate the recognition of the social constructedness of race into some practice of the free form, sorry, of the freedom these contingencies seem to promise, some way to proceed by which people can be liberated from the concrete reality of races as they determined are determined by racism. But the social constructedness of race and races in the racist state has very different meanings for groups differently placed with respect to these categories. The ontological freedom of categorical construction may be generic, but what is politically possible differs for those differently positioned and not all the political, politically possible but not all the politically possibilities for every group are desirable. Attempts by any group to act in this ontological freedom need to be informed by understanding of how the action is related to the possibilities and needs of others. I have some hope that if I can manage to refuse to enact, embody, animate this category, the white race, as I am supposed to, I can free up my energies and actions from a range of definable sorry, dis disabling confinements and burdens, and align my will with the forces which eventually will dissolve or dismantle that race as such. If it is objected that it is an exercise of white privilege to dissociate myself from the white race this way, I would say that in fact this project is strictly forbidden by the rules of white solidarity and white supremacist, sorry, supremacy, and it is not one of the privileges of white power. I may, it may also be objected that my adoption or recommendation of this strategy implies that the right thing to do in general for everyone is to dissolve, dismantle, bring an end to races. And if this is indeed, sorry, if this indeed is the implication, it can sound very threatening to some of the people whose races are thus to be erased. This point is well made by Franz Fanon in response to Jean-Paul Sartre, described by Henri Louis Gates Jr. Quote, Reading Sartre, Sartre's account of Negritude as an antithesis as an antithesis preparatory to a society without races, hence a transition and not a conclusion, Fanon reports, quote, I felt I had been rope, robbed of my last chance, end quote. Quote, Sartre in this work has destroyed black zeal, end quote. The dynamic creative claiming of racial identities and gender identity that arose as devices of people's oppression 
has been a politically powerful and life-enhancing response of oppressed people in modern and contemporary times. For members of oppressor groups to suddenly turn around and decide to abolish races would be, it seems, genocide, not liberation. I have a parallel unease about the project of dismantling the category of women, which some feminists seem to favor. But I am not suggesting that if white women should try to abandon the white race and contribute to its demolition, then women of other races should take the same approach to their racial categorization and their races. Quite the contrary. Approaches to the matter of dismantling a dominant subordinate structure surely should be asymmetrical. They should differ according to whether one has been molded into its category of dominance or its category of subordination. My hope is that it may contribute to the demise of racism. If we upset the logical symmetry of race, if black women, for instance, cultivate a racial identity and a distinctive, sexually egalitarian, black community, and other women of racialized groups likewise, while white women are undermining white racial identity and cultivating communities and agency among women along lines of affinity not defined by race, such an approach would work toward a genuine redistribution of power. Growing room. The experience of feminists unlearning femininity and our readiness to require men to unlearn masculinity shows that it is thinkable to unlearn whiteliness. If I am right about all this, then indeed, we even know a good deal about how to do it. We know that white feminists have to inform ourselves exhaustively of its politics. We know we have to avoid or be extremely alert in environments in which whiteliness is particularly required or rewarded, example academia. We know we have to practice new ways of being in environments which nurture different habits of feeling, perception, and thought, and that we will have to make these environments for ourselves since the world will not offer them to us. We know that the process will be collective, and that this collectively does not mean we will blend seamlessly with the others in a colorless mess. Women unlearning femininity together have not become clones of each other or of those who have been valuable models. As feminists, we have learned that we have to resist the temptation to encourage femininity in other women when, in moments of exhaustion and need, we longed for another's sacrificial mothering or wifing. <clears throat> Similarly, white women have to resist the temptation to encourage whiteliness in each other when, in moments of cowardice or insecurity, we long for the comfort of quote-unquote solidarity and superiority, or when we wish someone would relieve our painful uncertainty with the timely application of judgments and rules. Seasoned feminists, white feminists, along with feminists of other races, know how to transform consciousness. The first breakthrough is in the moment of knowing another way of being is possible. In this matter of a white woman's racedness, the possibility in question is the possibility of disengaging, on some level at least, one's own energies and wits from the continuing project of the social creation and maintenance of the white race. The possibility of being disloyal to that project by stopping constantly, making oneself whitely. And this project should be very attractive sorry, a very attractive one to white women, once we get it, that it is the possibility of not being whitely rather than the possibility of being whitely that holds some promise of our rescuing ourselves from the degraded condition of women in a white man's world. Okay, there's like two and a half pages of notes, so I'm going to read the notes. First note. The working title during that period was, quote-unquote, Ritual Libations and Points of Explosion, which referred to a remark made by Helen Wenzel in a review of My Politics of Reality, which appeared in the Women's Review of Books, Volume 1, Number 1, October 1983. Wenzel said, quote, Even when white women called third world women our friends, and they us, we still agonize over, quote-unquote, the issue. The result is that when we write or teach about race, racism, and feminism, we tend either to condense everything we have to say to the point of explosion, or, fearing just that explosion, we sprinkle our material 
with ritual libations which evaporate without altering our own or anyone else's consciousness, end quote. And coming down the cases, she continued, quote, Fry has fallen into both of these traps, end quote. Second note. For some critical reflection on, quote unquote, wanting to do good and on, quote unquote, not knowing how to act, see a response to lesbian ethics. Why ethics in this volume? Yeah, I thought it was relevant. Third note. Actually, what I think women of color have communicated in this matter is not so harsh as that. The point is that no one can do someone else's growing for her, that white women must not expect women of color to be on call to help and that there is a great deal of knowledge to be gained by reading, interacting, pay attention, which white women need not ask women of color to supply. Some women of color have helped me a great deal, sometimes in spite of me. Note four, she's referencing her own essays in her last book. Note five, it is easy for a white person who is trying to understand white privilege and white power in white supremacist states to make the mistake of self-servingly exaggerating that power and privilege, assuming it is total. In this case, I was earlier making the mistake of thinking that white domination means that white people totally control the definition of race and the races. Reading Bell Hook's Yearning, 1990, I woke up to the fact that Afro-Americans and other racialized people are engaged also in the definition of black and other quote-unquote race categories. White people have the power to enforce their own definitions in many, but not all, situations. But they are not the only people determining the meanings of race categories and race words. And what they determine for themselves and enforce is not necessarily congruent with others, sorry, with what others are determining for themselves. Point six, I want to thank Maria Lugones, whose palpably loving anger on this point makes me take it seriously. See... Hablando cara a cara, speaking face to face, an exploration of ethnocentric racism in Gloria Anzaldúa, editor, making face, making soul, haciendo caras, critical and creative perspectives by women of color, 1990. Note seven, Singleton, Carrie Jane, Race and Gender and Feminist Theory, Sage, volume... 6, number 1, summer 1989. Note 8. I am not unmindful here of the anxiety some readers may have about my reliance on a distinction between that which is physically given and that which is socially acquired. I could immensely complicate this passage by shifting from the material mode of talking about maleness and skin color to the formal mode of talking about conceptions or constructions of maleness and skin color. But it would not make anything clearer. It is perfectly meaningful to use the terms male and white as a pigment word, while understanding that sex categories and color categories are quote-unquote constructed as the kinds of categories they are, i.e. physical categories as opposed to social categories like lawyer or rhythmic categories like ordinals. Note 9. Moraga Sherry and Gloria Anzaldúa, editors, This Bridge Called My Back, writing by Radical Women of Color. Uh, 1981. I quote from the writings by Barbara Cameron, Christos, Doris Davenport, and Mitsui Yamada. Note 10. Bell Hooks, Feminist Theory from Margin to Center, 1985. Note 11. Gewal Tenney, John Longston, Drylongos, A Self-Portrait of Black America, 1983. I quote from statements by Jackson Jordan Jr., Hannah Nelson, John Oliver, Howard Roundtree, Rosa Wakefield, and Mabel Lincoln. Note 12. The people speaking in Drylongos, Drylongso, were responding to questions put by an interviewer. The narratives, as established, do not include the questions, but the people clearly were asked in some manner to say something about how they see white people or what they think white people generally are like. Most of them, but not everyone, prefaced or appended their comments with remarks to the effect that they did not think white people were quote-unquote like that by birth or blood, but by being brought up in a certain way in certain circumstances. Note 13. Identity, skin, blood, heart, in Yours in Struggle, edited by Ellie Bulkin, 
Minnie Bruce Pratt, and Barbara Smith, 1984. Uh, note 14, Lesbian Ethics, the last essay. Note 15. Balibar Etienne, Paradoxes of Universality, translated by Michael Edwards in David Theo Goldberg, editor, Anatomy of Racism, 1990. Extract from Racisme et Nationalisme in Etienne Balibar and Emmanuel Wallerstein's Race, Nation, Class, Paris, 1988. Note 16, The, tra the Traffic in Women, Toward an Anthology of Women, Raina R. Rater, 1975. Note 17. Carolyn Schaefer is the one who brought to my attention the fact that there is a certain contradiction in claiming both that this stage of women's, the women's movement was created by and belonging to white women and on the grounds of the generally better material welfare of white women compared to women of other races in the U.S., that white women are not all that badly off and don't really know what suffering is about. If white women were as generally comfortable, secure, and healthy as they might appear to some observers, they would not have participated as they have in an enormous movement whose first and most enduring issues are bodily integrity and economic self-sufficiency. Note 18. The Pathology of Racism, a conversation with third world women. This bridge called my rack, writings by radical women of color, Sherry Morega and Gloria Anzaldua, 1981. Note 19, this bridge called my back, a different page. Note 20, my lover, Carolyn, was explaining what I do for a living to our cohort, Koyesha, and included an account of quote-unquote deconstruction. Kiyosha, a welder and pipe fitter in the construction trades, said that wasn't a real word and offered quote-unquote demolition as the real word for this. Carolyn then had to admit, on my behalf, that all this deconstructing did not add up to any demolition and made up, sorry, and a made up abstract word was probably suitable to this abstract activity. Note 21, critical remarks, anatomy of racism, David Theo Goldberg, 1990.